IB Bio, Genetic Modification, Biotechnology, Part 1, examines three areas, the Human Genome Project, cloning, and stem cells. The essential idea is biologists have developed techniques for artificial manipulation of DNA, cells, and organisms. Here is an outline of the three parts in this biotechnology series. As you can see in Part 1, this movie is focused on the Human Genome Project, cloning, and stem cells. Part 2 looks at gene transfer and transgenic species, while Part 3 looks at how we find genes so that we can manipulate them, gene amplification, and DNA analysis. Humans have manipulated organisms to make products for a long time. Products such as cheese, wine, penicillin, not to mention the selective breeding of plants and animals. But this unit involves DNA technology, technology not available before the 1960s. Genetic engineering, also called genetic modification, is the direct manipulation of an organism's genome using biotechnology. New DNA may be inserted in the host genome by first isolating and copying the genetic material of interest and then inserting the DNA into the host organism. Here is our first IB syllabus statement of this movie. Define the term genome. The genome is all of the genetic material of an organism. The genome is encoded either in DNA or for some types of viruses, RNA. The genome includes both the genes, the coding sequences, and the non-coding sequences of the DNA or RNA. The genome is the total length of the DNA in an organism. The Human Genome Project was an international cooperative project with the aim of sequencing the three billion base pairs of the human genome. As well, the aim was to map the position of every gene in the human genome and identify disease causing genes. The Human Genome Project was completed in 1999-2000. The first aim of the Human Genome Project was to sequence the 3 billion base pairs of a human's genome. The second aim was to estimate the number of genes encoded in the human genome. We now know that the number of genes is somewhere between 20,000 and 25,000. And the third aim was to identify disease-causing genes for the purpose of drug therapy development. In addition to our knowledge of the number of genes within the human genome at 20,000 genes plus. The Human Genome Project has enabled us to identify genetic disease, create genetically based drugs and therapies, and the project has provided us with insight into the evolutionary histories of different species. Let me give you some examples of these last three outcomes. The Human Genome Project opened doors on disease identification. Scientists have determined that the gene for Huntington's disease is on the fourth chromosome and has a non-coding repetitive region nearby that is now used as a marker to identify whether someone has the gene or does not. The Human Genome Project has stimulated the proliferation of genetically based drugs and therapies such as the manufacture of human insulin by bacteria that transcribe and translate the human insulin gene as if it was their own and this works because when genes are transferred between species, the amino acid sequence of polypeptides translated from them is unchanged because the genetic code is universal. The Human Genome Project has stimulated the proliferation of genetically based drugs and therapies such as vaccines, vaccines that employ a genetically modified virus a virus with DNA sequences removed to make the virus less infectious. As well, monoclonal antibodies with attached designer drugs may have the promise of targeting cancer cells. The drug carried by the antibody, as the antibody circulates in the bloodstream, would be a genetically engineered molecule. The Human Genome Project has stimulated the proliferation of genetically based therapies, such as the injection of DNA that includes correct copies of a gene that would reverse, in this example, the degeneration of the retina, 
This is gene therapy. The Human Genome Project has provided insights on evolution, the relatedness of different species. The Human Genome Project successfully sequenced the DNA of a human for the purposes of identifying potential disease among other possible genetic characteristics of a person. Companies are now offering to sequence one's entire genome for approximately $1,000. Thus, there are many ethical issues that arise out of the Human Genome Project. For example, should genetic information become public? And if so, how does society prevent discrimination based on one's genetic profile? In the movie Gattaca, a young man's dreams are unavailable to him because of his genetic profile. Could genetic information be used to deny insurance or employment? How does society prevent discrimination of this sort if genetic information becomes public? One might want to know if they have a genetic tendency toward cancer or Alzheimer's disease, and there might be benefits more broadly to family or friends if we knew such information. But is the sequencing affordable to everyone, or do only the wealthy benefit? Who controls important genetic information? Should genes be patented? Should a corporation own the patent for the insulin gene as if the gene were a product? In 2009, some human genes were patented. But in 2013, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that human genes cannot be patented. But what about the gene of a plant that produces a protein with medicinal value to people? And suppose the plant only grows in Madagascar. Should the gene be patented? By whom? So that brings us to the next two IB syllabus statements as we transition within the movie. Define genome size as the total length of DNA in an organism. Compare genome size in the T2 phage virus, Escherichia coli, which is a bacterium, Drosophila melanogaster, the common fruit fly, Homo sapiens, humans, and Paris triponica, a plant. Here is a table that compares the genomes of various species. You can see that relative to a bacteria or the fruit fly, that the human genome at 3.2 billion base pairs is huge. Here is a direct comparison of the genome of these five species. All values are given in millions of base pairs. The virus has a very small genome, but Paris japonica, a rare Japanese plant, has a huge genome, some 50 times larger than the human genome. And here are two related IB syllabus statements. The number of chromosomes in a cell is a characteristic feature of members of a species and is called a karyotype. Compare the diploid chromosome number of Homo sapiens, humans, Pan troglodytes, the chimp, Canis familiaris, the domestic dog, Oryza sativa, rice, and Parascaris equorum, a roundworm. Here is a table comparing the number of chromosomes of Homo sapiens with 46, Pan troglodytes, the chimpanzee, with 48, Canis familiaris, the domestic dog, with 78, Oryza sativa, rice, with 24, and Parascaris equorum, a roundworm, with 2. But notice that despite having more chromosomes, the genome of the dog is smaller than the genome of a human. Chromosomes are simply linear strands of DNA that can vary in size. 78 smaller chromosomes would have a smaller genome than 46 larger chromosomes. And another related statement. Compare the number of genes in humans with other species. Keep in mind that the number of genes does not equal the genome size. Here we can compare the number of genes in various species. We can see that humans have a similar number of genes to a roundworm, but humans have more genes than yeasts or bacteria, but humans have fewer genes than zea maize, corn. Humans are estimated to have just over 20,000 genes. 
Now, alternative splicing of messenger RNA, a process that results in more than one polypeptide from the same raw transcript, is one thought on how the complexity of a human is controlled by a relatively small number of genes. Now, it's thought, or it has been thought, that most of the human genome is non-coding, while significant sections of the human genome are likely not to code for protein, more and more we're finding roles for sections of the DNA that we thought previously had no role. So be careful in your thinking here, and let's not use the term junk DNA to describe what might be called non-coding DNA. And now we shift our focus to cloning. Clones are groups of genetically identical organisms derived asexually from a single original parent cell. In these photographs, we have clones as groups of genetically identical organisms derived from a single original parent cell. In the two micrographs at the top of the slide, there are cells all genetically identical from a single cell formed after a sperm and egg fused. You can see in the top right photo, one of the eight cells is being removed. The two pairs of identical twins in the lower photographs are clones. These two boys were derived from a single original parent cell, and these two girls were derived from a single original parent cell. Many plant species and some animal species have natural methods of cloning. Clones are groups of genetically identical organisms derived asexually from a single original parent cell. Now, many species of plants, as you can see in this diagram, can grow shoots, stolons, or rhizomes that produce genetically identical plants. The three plants in this diagram are genetically identical organisms, clones derived from a single original parent cell through asexual cell division. Here are the relevant IB syllabus statements. Define the term clone. A clone is a group of genetically identical organisms derived from a single original parent cell. And secondly, state that many plant species and some animal species have natural methods of cloning. Describe one example each of natural plant and animal cloning. Plants, as you can see in the top two images, are easily broken into fragments and then under the right conditions, they grow fully new individuals. Starfish in the lower left corner, upon being broken, grow into new individuals, clones. Duckweed colonies in the lower right are natural clones. All of the individual plants seen in the lower right image are derived from a single original parent cell. Each of the three groups of aspens seen in this photo are clones. The aspen put out rhizomes underground that sprout new individuals so that all the trees in a single group are genetically identical. And that brings us to the next IB syllabus statement. Explain the formation of animal clones by breaking up the embryo into more than one group of cells. The identical twins seen in the lower photographs are monozygotic. These two boys in the lower left were derived from a single zygote that very early on in its development split into two, two groups of cells genetically identical, each of which asexually developed into twins, clones. The original single embryo looked much like this one in the upper left corner. The embryo, for reasons that scientists do not understand, broke apart into two groups of cells genetically identical. In the upper right micrograph, you can see a cell being pulled off the embryo. As a separate cell, it might grow into an individual that is genetically identical to the individual that develops from the group. This is all done through asexual cell division. Once again, the embryo seen here in the image is being separated into more than one group of cells, genetically identical groups that can develop into clones. Animals can be cloned using this method. Then here's the next IB syllabus statement. Explain the method for cloning adult animals using differentiated cells. And in describing this method, use the phrase somatic cell nuclear transfer. 
So now we will take a close look at a specific type of cloning technique using differentiated cells called somatic cell nuclear transfer. You will need to study the technique shown on this slide and the next one a few times in order to fully understand the process. Please study the details as often as you need to. Now, the technique for cloning using differentiated cells, sometimes known as somatic cell nuclear transfer, begins with two donor cells. One animal donates a cell and a second animal donates the cell. Now, the cell coming from this animal is differentiated. The cell has a specialized role in the body, and in this case, it comes from the mammary gland. Now, the other cell is an egg cell, but the nucleus has been removed from the egg cell. So the nucleus from the differentiated udder cell is starved of nutrients. Now, this arrests the cell cycle and makes the cell somewhat pluripotent, causes a de-differentiation. Then, this de-differentiated nucleus is inserted into the egg cell whose nucleus has been removed. Now an electric pulse is used to facilitate fusion. And with that, we have a cell that will become an embryo with the DNA of the differentiated cell, the DNA of this adult sheep seen here. Spend some time studying the details of this slide. The embryo is then implanted into a surrogate mother, not related to either the egg donor or the differentiated cell donor. And months later, the embryo has developed into a clone of the sheep that donated the differentiated mammary cell, the sheep in the upper left on the previous slide. What makes the technique for cloning using differentiated cells so powerful is that a choice can be made about what you want your sheep population to look like. This sheep, this sheep with the light face, the thick wool, let's say, was chosen as the sheep to be cloned. With conscious choice about which individuals are to be cloned, there is the power to enhance our food supply from the farm or bring species back from the brink of extinction or the power to clone individuals whose organs might be harvested or... I want you to consider the ethical issues here. Now, let's just briefly discuss the potential benefits and possible harmful effects of cloning. One problem is that the clones formed from differentiated cells, as Dolly was, the sheep in the earlier images, they appear to die young. They die prematurely. This is a huge issue. And then, what is the purpose of cloning? Is it for organs? The perfect child? And what is lost when individuality is lost? And who has access? Only the wealthy? Or could we potentially bring extinct species back to the living? In January 2000, the Pyrenean ibex became extinct. In 2009, Pyrenean ibex DNA was used in a cloning project in an attempt to bring the species back from extinction. Although a living specimen was produced, it died after seven minutes due to lung failure. More work needs to be done, but the potential is there. As we head toward the end of the movie, let me bring back some material that we studied earlier in the cells unit. The material here intersects biotechnology. Outline that stem cells retain the capacity to divide and have the ability to differentiate along different pathways. Outline the therapeutic use of stem cells to treat Stargardt's disease and one other named example. Stem cells are undifferentiated cells, but they are important because they have the capacity to divide and differentiate along different pathways. The handful of cells that comprise an early embryo are stem cells. These cells could be harvested, as you see here, and cultured to differentiate into a tissue that might repair tissues that are damaged. Stem cells, as undifferentiated cells, are cells open to differentiation. They can be cultured to differentiate such that they can be used for therapy to treat leukemia or Stargardt's disease, a disease of the eye. If diseased tissues can be replaced by healthy tissues derived from stem cells, 
much suffering can be alleviated. Stargardt's disease results from a genetic mutation. There is a loss of vision beginning between the ages of 6 and 12. In 2010, stem cells were implanted in a woman for a four-month trial, and vision was improved. Here's an IB syllabus statement that follows up on stem cell use. Discuss the ethics of therapeutic use of stem cells, one, taken from specially created embryos, or two, from umbilical cord blood of a newborn baby, or three, from an adult's own tissues. While embryos are the source of stem cells, harvesting stem cells from embryos is hugely controversial. Should eight-celled embryos be considered living to the extent that they have rights under the law? On the other hand, the use of embryonic stem cells to repair damaged tissues, like the Stargardt's example, could alleviate suffering. In vitro fertilization, the fusion of sperm and egg in a petri dish outside of the body results in an embryo whose stem cells could be used to produce new specialized tissues. Is this ethically acceptable? Here's an outline of the arguments around using embryos as a source of stem cells. Against the use of embryos as stem cells would be that an embryo is a life no matter what. In favor of using embryos for stem cells would be that early stage embryos have yet to develop, early stage embryos do not feel pain, and that deliberate embryo production is not denying what would have been a life. And these embryos, with their stem cells, could help to reduce suffering. There are other sources of stem cells, from the placenta or from the umbilical cord. The use of the umbilical cord or placental stem cells would remove the ethical concerns of using embryos. Scientists are working on harvesting stem cells from the body of the person requiring the new tissues or transplanted tissues. In fact, new techniques are being developed where the nucleus of a differentiated cell of the patient is placed into an egg that has had its nucleus removed. The embryo formed from this technique could be used to develop tissues that are transplanted back into the patient. Consider how ethical concerns shape governmental restrictions on stem cell use and how governments are influenced by both cultural and religious traditions. Now, as you think about the ethical considerations of stem cell use, consider the source of the stem cells, embryos, as compared to umbilical cord blood, as compared to stem cells generated from an adult's own tissue. Now, there are the ethical norms around stem cells would shift with the culture and shift over time as research carried out years ago would probably not be considered ethically acceptable today. Furthermore, it's important in stepping into this area of thinking that you have a full understanding of the science before making any ethical decisions. Now, if embryos are the stem cell source of choice, the obvious ethical questions arise. Does the embryo have a right to life? Does using stem cells from an embryo kill a life? And at what point in development does a life begin? Now, what about the situation where we specially created embryos using in vitro fertilization as the mechanism to generate the embryo? I think the same questions arise. Is it ethical to create human lives, embryos, just for stem cells? And women who are involved in the IVF process are given hormones to prepare for IVF, and there are some risks. And removing eggs in the IVF process is an invasive surgical procedure, and obviously paying for eggs could lead to the exploitation of certain groups. But in any case, especially creating embryos uh, as a source of stem cells would, would result in a situation where no human that would have had a chance to live was denied its chance. So to some degree, this specially created embryo using IVF relieves us of some of the ethical constraints of using an embryo straight away as the source of stem cells. In making the argument in favor of stem cell use, regardless of whether you're using an embryo as the stem cell source or specially created embryos using IVF as the source, the upside is the treatment of disease. 
alleviating suffering, treatment of disease, alleviating suffering. So let's compare, let's ethically compare stem cell source with the sources being embryos, even if they're specially created using IVF, umbilical cord blood, and stem cells from adult tissue, such as bone marrow. Now, in this comparison, starting with embryos, I will evaluate, giving you the pluses and the minuses. The one plus of using embryos is the high pluripotency. In other words, there's an unlimited differentiation potential. A downside is that there's a risk of tumor formation. Another downside is if we use an embryo for stem cells to be inserted into someone else, there is the potential of immune system rejection by the recipient due to the genetic differences between the embryo and the recipient. And lastly, in taking cells from an embryo, the embryo is likely to die. In evaluating the ethics of stem cell source with respect to umbilical cord blood, one upside is that the stem cells from the umbilical cord are easily obtained and stored. There are commercial services available. But a downside is that the stem cells from umbilical cord have a limited capacity to differentiate. They're not nearly as pluripotent as embryonic stem cells. There is less chance of tumor formation as compared to embryo cells. That's an upside. And there's a better potential genetic match, a better match between stem cell and recipient, and this reduces immune rejection. Uh, and, you know, the umbilical cord would be discarded in any case, so there are fewer concern, concerns about the death of an embryo or the loss of life. And lastly, in our ethical evaluation of stem cell source, let's look at stem cells from adult tissue. First, the downside is that they're fairly difficult to obtain, being located deep in tissues, such as bone marrow. They have a limited capacity to differentiate. They're not as pluripotent as embryonic stem cells. There's less chance of tumor formation. That's an upside. And the genetic match between the stem cells and the recipient would eliminate immune rejection when the stem cells come from an adult's own tissue. And there are really very few ethical constraints or concerns about the death of an embryo. In terms of the arguments against the use of embryonic stem cells, the primary argument is the source of the stem cells. In other words, embryos would provide stem cells, but using embryos would require killing a life. Every embryo should be given a chance of developing. As well, embryonic stem cells could develop into tumor cells. And stem cell source, in the case of embryonic stem cells, is limited, so it's expensive. It's not available to everyone. The arguments in favor of stem cell use are that stem cells can be used to treat diseases called therapeutic cloning, and this reduces suffering. Stem cells can be used to build new tissues as a source of transplants, and stem cells could have genes inserted, and then these cells are then injected into the tissue that requires a normal gene rather than the faulty gene. This is called gene therapy. And that brings us to the end of IB Biogenetic Modification and Biotechnology Part 1. In Part 2, we will look at gene transfer and transgenic species.